Englishman, Lieutenant General Birdwood was in charge of the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps from December 1914. A non-drinker, he lived a Spartan existence and was prepared to spend lives ruthlessly. Not a gifted strategist or organiser, he understood the difference between English, New Zealand and Australian troops. Sir John Monash, commander of the 4th Australian Brigade, said, Birdwood is a small thin man. He has nothing striking or salty about him. He speaks with a stammer and has a rather nervy unquiet manner. However, there is no mistaking his perfect grasp of the whole business of soldiering. I have been around him for hours and heard him talking to privates, buglers, gunners, colonels, signalers, and generals and every time he has left them with a better knowledge of his business than they had before. He appeals to me most thoroughly. Birdwood was not as full of praise as Mon Nush. He said of Mon Nush, an exceptionally able man on paper but not a good horseman. Birdwood was much admired by the Australian and New Zealand troops because he swam in Anza Cove despite constant shell fire. His photo swimming nude in an Australian paper caused a torrent of swimsuits to be posted to him. After Gallipoli he was in charge of the British Fifth Army. Birdwood decided that the landing would be made in the dark without a preliminary barrage from his escorting battle cruisers. This decision left a narrow time window for a landing. The moon sets about 3 a.m., dawn is at 4 a.m. with the sun rising at 5 a.m. He decided the first Anzacs would land at 30 a.m. This meant that the next waves of soldiers would be landing in the early morning light. The landing place for all Anzacs was to be the north end of Brighton Beach. This beach is a five-foot bank and the plane runs back from there. A perfect spot to get horses and stores ashore. The left flank would be near a fortified ridge called Auriburna, the right about a mile north of Gabati Hill. This small hill is fortified and known to have modern guns. After landing on Brighton Beach, the covering force of 4,000 men would push forward aiming to reach Third Ridge. The left flank of the covering force would occupy Battleship Hill while the right flank occupied Gabati and destroyed the guns. There are reported to be guns on 400 Plateau. These are to be captured before moving on. The covering force then will occupy the Third Ridge and Scrubby Knoll. The Third Ridge is the key to the entire battlefield. The Anzac commander, Birdwood knew it when he planned the attack. The Turkish commander, Von Sanders knew it when he planned the defense. The commander of the Turkish division, Mustafa Kemal took his whole division to the third ridge when he arrived. Number two an Australian brigade lands immediately after the covering force. They will secure the left flank by extending the line to Fisherman's Hut and north to Hill 971. Next to land will be the reserve brigade. They will leapfrog through the existing forces and capture Mautip, about 10 kilometers away. Here the Anzacs would hold the Turkish reserves in the area and cut off the retreat of Turkish troops from Cape Hells. At 2.53, the moon being now very low, the ships moved slowly ahead, towing the boats behind them. Some of the destroyers, closing a few minutes later, past the shapes of big ships with strings of boats behind. At three o'clock the moon sank and the night became intensely dark. Just before the moon set, Lieutenant Fike, who was a company commander in 2nd Battalion, 27th Regiment, had been looking out to sea from his position on Rebernu. Through his binoculars he saw a large number of ships. Two other duty patrols also reported to him the same sighting. It was not clear if they were stationary or moving, but he sent a report of the sighting to his battalion commander, Major Ismet Bay, who assured him there would be a landing at Gabutip. 
The Major asked, How many of these ships are warships and how many transports? I replied, It is impossible to distinguish them in the dark but the quantity of ships is very large. A little while later the moon sank below the horizon and the ships became invisible in the dark. At 3.30 the battleships stopped, and the order was given to the tows to go ahead and land. The small steamboats behind the battleships cast each with its tow of three ships' boats behind. As the horses took the strain, the boats began to leap and race. The tows were to form all twelve in line and then make for the beach. The direction was to be given by the naval officer in charge of the starboard or southernmost tow. The other tows were to keep abreast of him, with about fifty yards interval between each one and the next. There was some difficulty in getting into line. The night was so black that it was often impossible to see the next tow on either side much less the whole line of them. Some of the toes appear to have sandwiched themselves into a wrong place in the line. But there could be no waiting or indecision. For coming on slowly behind. The small steamboats raced due east. The rowing boats behind them. In each boat. Were from thirty to forty soldiers four seamen, and a coxswain. In the steamboat ahead of each tow, was a naval officer, with a senior officer to every four steamboats. In the last rowing boat of each tow was a midshipman. Just then at the summit of another knoll one thousand yards south there flashed a bright yellow light. It was seen by almost everyone in the boats. Some took it for a signal lamp. Others for a bright flare of shavings or a small bonfire. There was death-like silence for a moment. The figure of a man was seen on the skyline of Plateau above them. From the top of Rebernu a rifle flashed. A bullet whizzed overhead and plunged into the sea. A second or two of silence then four or five shots as if from a sentry group. Another pause then a scattered, irregular fire growing very fast at this moment the twelve toes were very close together, running into the foot of the Iburu Null. The Null juts out in a small cape, and the boats of the ninth and 10th battalions, striking the point of this, were the first to reach the land. The 11th battalion ran past the north of it a little further before arriving at the beach. The men, with their heavy packs and their kit hanging loosely on their shoulders, were crowded in the boats, the seamen among them ready to cast loose the tow rope and get out the oars, instead of the reasonably good going they anticipated, they had struck the impossible terrain that the plan was intended to avoid. Barely pausing, the first wave swarmed up Rebernu's steep gorse-covered slopes. Within twenty minutes, the Turks on Rebernu had been dislodged, and troops from all three battalions were emerging onto Plugis Plateau. Here they sorted themselves into their proper battalions. As daylight revealed the features of the terrain, including the razor edge that made getting off Plugis difficult for the 11th Battalion, they set out for their objectives with shrapnel shells from Gabatip bursting over the main valley below Plugis. A weird shrieking note culminated in a deafening report and a cloud of smoke some thirty feet high, wrote Lance Corporal Mitchell. Simultaneously there was the swishing sound as the bullets beat down bushes and swept the earth. The valley acquired the name Shrapnel Gully by now. The second and third waves had landed. Sounding like hailstones on a roof, fire from the Turks on the flanks of the first waves rush peppered the destroyers that brought men close inshore and thudded into the toes taking them onwards. Heavy fire from the fishermen's hut mauled the rest of the 11th battalion and part of the 12th. 
The surviving Australians scaled the sheer slopes of Walker's Ridge and the Sphinx and headed inland. Colonel Sinclair McLilligan reached the beach and found most of the Turks had run away and his troops well placed to take the third ridge. Despite his position and his orders to keep going at all costs, he decided to dig defensive trenches on the second ridge. The transport with the 5th and 7th battalions aboard, anchored just north of Rebernu. The captain started unloading the 7th battalion using his own boats. The first four boats headed towards Fisherman's Hut and were riddled by the Turkish platoon there. Over 100 of the 140 men in the boats were hit. Sinclair MacLidgen told the commander of the 2nd Brigade to deploy on the right flank instead of the left as planned. With the 2nd Brigade now switched to the right flank, the capture of the heights on the left, which was the 1st Division's main objective became extremely difficult. Sinclair MacLigan had now prevented the 1st Division accomplishing their task.